Hello and good afternoon again to all of our audience members. Thank you for uh, attending all of our summit programming since this morning. We're so glad that you've made it all the way through to our closing session. Uh, this session is going to focus on how we can all take today's lessons learned and insights and move forward from here with a focus on our youth. As a reminder to all of our audience member, we of course are still welcoming your questions for the audience Q&A portion of this session. You can submit those questions in the text box below the video feed, and you can submit those questions anonymously or with your name, however you so choose. Uh, lastly, instructions for claiming continuing education will be provided at the very end of the summit following this plenary. And with that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our final speaker, Dr. Scott Hadlin. Scott Hadlin is the Chief of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital for Children and Harvard Medical School. He holds triple board certification in general pediatrics, adolescent medicine, and addiction medicine. Dr. Hadlin's clinical and research interests focus on adolescent and young adult substance use disorder prevention and treatment, and on improving care for youth and families affected by substance use. As a part of these efforts, he seeks to improve education on addiction to pediatricians in the U.S. and beyond. He was the 2020 recipient of the Emerging Leader Award in Adolescent Health from the American Academy of Pediatrics. His work has been published in leading journals, including The Lancet, the Boston Medical Journal, Pediatrics, and JAMA Pediatrics. He has been featured in the New York Times, The Washington Post, NBC News, National Public Radio, and other leading news outlets. Dr. Hadlin's research has been funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and numerous foundations. Dr. Hadlin, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. The floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, it's really an honor to be here today and, and to speak with all of you at this pivotal time in our collective history. Uh, as Alana just mentioned, I work as a pediatrician providing both primary care and addiction treatment to teens and young adults. And before I share with you my thoughts today on youth intervention, I, I wanna make sure that we center this discussion on the voices of the young people that we serve. Um, I, I, before speaking to you today, I asked my patients for their perspectives. Um, here's what one patient of mine, a, a, 26 year old now in longstanding recovery from opioid use disorder had to say, when it comes to addiction, recovery and stigma and young people specifically, this patient said, they don't want their life to continue to be defined by their substance use, including if that means being defined by not using substances. Because having your identity be centered around being in recovery is like your life is still being centered around substances. I think the conversation isn't just about making it so that people won't die, but also the people would be present for their lives again. And so today, as I share with you my reflections on young people, prevention, and our collective path forward, I want to make sure that what we just heard from my patient echoes throughout our conversation, that, that tackling the nation's overdose crisis isn't just about saving lives. It's not even mainly about preventing substance use or addiction, even though I'll talk a lot about this in a moment. I want to make sure that as we push for solutions, we, sh we push for ones that do much more. We push for solutions that help people live and thrive and achieve their greatest potential and experience joy. I, I want us to set the, bias, uh, the bar as high as possible. And so with that as our goal, let's use this opportunity today to reorient how we think about the national addiction and overdose crises. A few weeks ago, we were once again hit with the news that overdose deaths in the U.S. hit an all-time high again in 2021, and they reached nearly 108,000 lives lost in a single year. And I know for me, the magnitude of this is hard to grasp, and the constant bad news sometimes feels so relentless that it can leave you feeling numb. And yet, amid this bad news, there was a headline in April that stood out even among the others that left me especially despondent, and it was this. From 2019 to 2021, overdoses involving fentanyl more than tripled among teenagers. And this study led by Joseph Friedman and his colleagues at UCLA used overdose death data from the CDC and showed that our national overdose crisis, which many of us have typically thought of as being a mostly adult problem, has landed squarely on young people. I know I'm indebted to Joe and his team for shining a light on these numbers. Um, they match up with the experience of pediatricians like me on the front lines, and that is that we're seeing a rising number of young people overdose and, yes, die. And this is not something I've been emotionally prepared for. You know, we pediatricians aren't used to our patients dying. 
Most children are healthy and resilient, and even when they get sick, they usually recover and thrive. But the overdose crisis has turned this comfort I once had on its head. I worry that the same longstanding sense of comfort that I had has caused us as a nation to overlook the importance of teens in our national dialogue about this crisis. Teens only make up a tiny percentage of overdose deaths nationally. In 2021, this percentage was about 1%. But this number belies how important youth are in this crisis. Today, I have one central message, and it is this. Any viable long-term solution to our national crisis must have a comprehensive and fully funded strategy to prevent substance use and addiction in young people. P addiction is a pediatric onset condition. Three quarters of adults with addiction first started using drugs or alcohol before age 18. And by the time they graduate from high school, one in seven teens has misused opioids. Across the US, 1.6 million teens currently live with addiction, a number that's likely to climb even higher in the wake of COVID, which as we know, as socially isolated teens, increased rates of depression, suicide, trauma, anxiety, and led many people to increase the intensity of their substance use. Although it's true that compared to all other age groups, relatively fewer teens die of overdoses, once teens age into their early and mid-20s, fatal overdose rates take off and suddenly account for tens of thousands of deaths every year. Here's the problem with our current national approach to the overdose crisis. Each year, the U.S. spends close to $40 billion to tackle drugs. Right off the top, about 43% of this is spent perpetuating the war on drugs, giving billions of dollars to interdiction and law enforcement efforts. Fortunately, we're also increasingly spending money on life-saving services like expanding addiction treatment, distributing naloxone, giving out clean equipment for people who inject drugs, and building long-term recovery services. And let me be clear, these interventions are absolutely critical and they are evidence-based. I support them and I want them for my patients. But these resources all target the late stages of addiction. They do very little to prevent people from starting to use substances in the first place. The amount that we spend on a country, uh, as a country on preventing substance use is far less. It's equivalent to only six or 7% of our annual drug policy spending. I often lament that our response to the overdose crisis has been a little bit like waiting until people with cardiovascular disease experience a heart attack before acting, rather than trying to address the underlying root causes like high blood pressure or diabetes years in advance. I firmly believe the key to solving the national overdose crisis is for us to take a longer term view. We absolutely must continue to provide treatment, harm reduction, overdose prevention, and recovery services. And we also need to ensure a safer drug supply and safer spaces for people who use. But while we do these things, we also need to act to prevent today's children and teens from becoming tomorrow's overdose statistics. We need to take this longer term view, one that isn't just looking forward one, two, three, or five years down the road, but instead one that looks 10 to 20 years into the future or even longer. We need a national all-in strategy for substance use prevention a strategy that looks holistically at the early life course that aims to reduce not just substance use itself, but goes upstream, supporting and lifting up children and young families. One that goes even further upstream, helping people who are pregnant or even thinking about becoming pregnant long before they have a child who might one day grow into a teen or an adult at risk of having an overdose. Of course, this will be a challenge. Elections and media outlets operate on much shorter cycles. But without an eye to where we will be decades into the future, I worry that death rates will climb to levels that we could never have thought possible. So what does a comprehensive national prevention strategy look like? And how does stigma, which we know to be so harmful and counterproductive for all people who use substances, and which we've spoken about so much today, how does stigma factor in specifically for young people? Let me start with that first question. One simple and true answer is that we need to ramp up substance use prevention in schools and communities. This isn't the whole answer. In fact, it's far from it. And I'll get back to this in a moment. But prevention works and needs to be scaled up. Of course, our track record of drug prevention in this country has not, as many of you will know, been a strong one. Um, what a lot of us think of when we envision school-based drug prevention programs are outdated and ineffective. 
slogans like just say no, or this is your brain on drugs might come to mind. Older programs use fear-based tactics, trying to scare teens into not using, and in some cases backfire, driving some teens to want to try to use substances out of curiosity. Many of these programs left people with the impression that drug and alcohol prevention doesn't work, but it can. Here's the thing. The science has quietly evolved. There are effective school-based programs out there, including programs like life skills training and Project Alert, among others, which have been linked to lower rates of substance use initiation, and among those who have already started using decreased intensity of use. For teens who might be at increased risk for addiction because they have underlying mental health problems like depression or anxiety, another school-based program, Preventure, is also highly effective. Strengthening Families is another effective program that gives parents and families the skills to help support teens in avoiding substance use. Communities that care is another successful example in which entire cities or regions draw on a menu of evidence-based interventions and design their own locally tailored strategy to prevent substance use in young people. And it too has been linked to lower substance use initiation. Here's how these prevention programs of today differ from those of the past. Programs today avoid fear-mongering and instead promote teens' personal strengths. They promote self-esteem, stress coping strategies, and communication skills, and they build bonds between teens, families, and schools. By playing to teens' strengths, they prevent use across a range of substances, which is key because the drugs driving overdoses in the United States keep shifting and actually, most deaths involve multiple substances. But these prevention programs require money, training, and protected time. And because of this, they need the full backing of governments and school systems for large-scale rollout. They also need us, as everyday citizens, to buy into and champion the idea that substance use is not inevitable, that it can be prevented. I can't tell you the number of times I hear parents, teachers, and other trusted adults in the community ask me, well, don't all teens just end up using substances anyway? Here's the truth. There's a silent public health success that very few people know about and that we rarely speak of. We're actually currently at an all-time low for the percentage of teens who use substances. In fact, by the time they graduate from high school, the majority of teens aren't actively using drugs or alcohol at all. I believe we can build on the success and help more teens understand that substance use, substance use isn't some inevitable rite of passage, but we adults need to support them in this. Studies tell us that the younger a teen is when they start using substances, the higher their lifetime chances of developing an addiction. Because of this, one of the single most important things we can do for teens is to help them delay the onset of their substance use. Yes, most people will go on to use alcohol, cannabis, or some other substance at some point in their lives, and I'm not demonizing this at all, but delaying this process for young people is incredibly important and is a key strategy to sustainably addressing our national crisis. But we adults need to buy into this idea and we need to commit to it. Let me add another dimension here. As we scale up prevention, we also need to be truthful with teens and give them accurate information. There are some complicated facts when it comes to drugs and alcohol, and we need to be better stewards of this information. Let me give you another example. Teens in my clinic will often tell me that a well-intentioned parent or teacher has told them, vaping will destroy your lungs. (laughs) And as many of you probably know, this statement isn't actually terribly accurate. When we're hyperbolic, teens see right through us, and the trust they have in us can be shattered. So just to riff off of this example of the vault, Here's the complicated set of facts that I think about as a pediatrician who specializes in addiction for teens when it comes to vaping. The vast majority of teens who will vape will not have any lung complications. That severe lung injury we heard so much about just prior to COVID was likely caused by illicitly manufactured THC cartridges, many of which had been cut with vitamin E. And in fact, most teens who vape won't have any serious lung complications from it especially if they're not using THC or if their cartridges come from a safe, reliable source. And at the same time, vaping is far less harmful than traditional cigarettes. But on the other hand, nicotine levels delivered by vapes are often much higher than from cigarettes. Because of this, rates of nicotine use disorder may be rising again after a long time decline, and a not insignificant number of youth who vape will go on to use cigarettes. 
So this stuff is complex. So when we talk to young people, we need to become familiar with these facts. We need to be accurate when we talk about these facts. And then we need to communicate them in an objective, unheated manner. We can't be hyperbolic because when we need to really communicate that something is risky, like when we want to talk about the potency of fentanyl and the current dangers of our drug supply, we need teens to be able to trust us and our information so that they can be safe. So what does this mean practically? Well, as we scale up prevention, we need to be mindful in our language. I've actually heard some people argue that stigma against people who use drugs is somehow a good thing because it keeps teens from using substances in the first place. That if we showcase someone who has lost everything because of addiction, lost their family, lost their job, lost their home, and then tell a teen, don't use drugs or you'll end up like them, that we can somehow prevent teens from using substances. I want to firmly counter this. Teens will be less likely to use substances if we build up their strengths and support their self-efficacy and healthy development and then equip them with the best possible, most accurate information. Stigmatizing people who use drugs only makes it more difficult for the teen who does develop a problem with substances to then feel comfortable enough to turn to a trusted adult or healthcare provider for help. Perpetuating stigma is not the way to reduce teen substance use. So perhaps the most important take home then is that we need to look to the future and aim to tackle the overdose crisis by looking ahead decades and in doing so, we need to center our work on the voices of young people. They should be the one to help us hone our prevention strategies. They should tell us what information we need, they need to know in the era of fentanyl. And when we listen to youth, we need to ensure that these teens have diverse representation. I'm wholly cognizant that as I speak to you today, I'm a cisgender white man with a single life experience. We need to center our work on the voices and needs of youth who are black, brown, or indigenous, of youth with disabilities, of youth who identify as LGBTQ+, of youth with intersecting identities. We need to recognize that because of systemic racism and anti-LGBTQ stigma, the overdose and HIV epidemics have disproportionately impacted youth of color and other minoritized communities. And we need to partner with and often step aside and cede our power to these communities to create robust and relevant substance use prevention and treatment. We need to know from the young people we serve what messaging they know will impact them and their communities, what information they need to ensure that they stay safe and healthy during a time of enormous peril. Now, so far I've spoken about prevention in a very classic sense of the word around the idea that empowering teens, supporting their strengths, and equipping them with knowledge will help to reduce substance use. And I truly believe that it will. But this is also a fairly simplistic way, uh, way of approaching the problem. Those of us that know people who have overdosed know that the real world is much more complicated, that prevention messaging only will go so far. And as we discussed at the outset, our goal here can't simply be the prevention of drug and alcohol use but we need to help young people achieve true wellness to help them thrive. To do this, we need to take a comprehensive approach that supports young people across the entire early life course. What do I mean by this? Well, to highlight for you how we consistently miss opportunities to correct course for young people who are struggling, and in doing so, miss opportunities to prevent addiction early in its development. Let me share with you the story of one of my patients, Andre. Andre's story also highlights the myriad ways that stigma gets in our way in this field. I have his family's permission to share his story with you, and I've changed his name to protect his identity. Andre was a young man I treated for opioid and stimulant use disorders who died tragically at the age of 23. I knew Andre because I was his doctor for four years. I've also come to know his mother since his passing, and she's helped me understand even better who he was and what he lived for. Long before he struggled with substances, Andre was a loving son and brother and a skilled athlete who made the varsity basketball team when he was only a freshman in high school. But odds were stacked against Andre throughout his short life. He had a strong family history of addiction with multiple family members and long-term recovery from an alcohol use disorder. And Andre shared with me that from an early age, he knew that he had come from what he was told was a family of addicts. 
never told me what that must have felt like for him as a child. But I imagine that that label, that stigma, must have left an indelible mark on his sense of self at an early age. When he was a child, Andre survived sexual abuse from a neighbor. And his mother shared with me that Andre felt so much shame that he hid it from her for years. And then when he was a teen, Andre lost his father to cancer. Unsurprisingly, after all he had been through, Andre developed worsening depression and anxiety and began to struggle with substances when he was a teenager. And his mother sought care at every stage. But securing the services that he needed, interventions for trauma, psychiatric treatment, addiction care made for teens, it was near impossible. These services were difficult to locate. They were siloed from one another, uh, one another and from traditional medical settings. They had long wait lists and they were only rarely covered by insurance. And of course, stigma lay at the heart of this. Because of stigma, his pediatrician had never learned how to help teens with addiction and had to refer him out elsewhere for help. Because of stigma, Andre's addiction treatment was provided outside the traditional medical system, just as it is for so many people every day across this country. Because of stigma, his family had to fight for insurance coverage for the care he so desperately needed, care that never would have been denied him if his diagnosis were different, say, childhood cancer or diabetes. So by the time I met him in 2017, Andre had been struggling with severe opioid and stimulant use disorders for many years. And like so many other youth living with addiction, we had a lot working against us as we partnered together. Intergenerational addiction, childhood trauma, unaddressed mental health concerns, seemingly endless barriers in the health system. And at every step of the way, stigma made a challenging journey even harder. I distinctly remember spending a Saturday night talking to a sober home manager who was evicting Andre because he had learned that Andre was on Suboxone. And the manager believed that being on medication was just trading one addiction for another. Now, when it comes to this trope that we so often hear, we know that this keeps adults from getting evidence-based treatment. But even worse, when it comes from trusted adults in the lives of youth, that stigma sticks. And it did for Andre, who chose to go off medications at that point, and then experienced a relapse that left him on the street for several months. We adults need to remember that for all their independence and enormous resilience surviving during a time when overdose deaths are at their highest, youth ultimately do look up to us and our words matter. When we stigmatize rather than support, that stigma sticks. After four years in and out of recovery, Andre died last year. One of more than 7,000 youth under the age of 25 who died of drug-related causes in 2020. More than 7,000 adolescents and young adults who would have had decades of life ahead of them, who left behind grieving parents and family members. And many of those family members are themselves still young, with many years ahead of them, but now they'll spend those years without their beloved son, their daughter, their brother, their sister. We can and must do more. Many of you, like me, know the answers here, and we need to advocate like never before. Up till now, we've been talking about substance use prevention in its most basic form, but let's now say out loud what we really need to tackle the national overdose crisis and to help youth and families truly thrive. First, for everyone who uses substances, we need to strive for a safer drug supply, and we need overdose prevention, addiction treatment, and harm reduction services, and we need them to take into account the unique needs of youth. We need young people to survive so we can help them thrive. But when it comes to these services right now, youth experience dual stigma. They at once feel the stigma of being a person who uses substances, that stigma that we've talked about so much today, but they also experience the stigma of being the only person in the room among others who may have been using substances for decades. For youth of color, LGBTQ youth, youth with disabilities, or youth with intersecting identities, this stigma is amplified even further. We need welcoming, affirming spaces designed by youth for youth. Second, we need to vastly expand youth mental health services. Although drug overdoses can and, and often do happen with a single exposure to a counterfeit pill or fentanyl uh, tainted drugs, 
Data show that most teens who overdose have underlying mental health concerns or prior, tra uh, prior trauma. Many overdoses are in fact suicides in teens. Our country has long had insufficient mental health care for everyone, but for youth, this squeeze is even tighter. And the shortage has only been intensified during the pandemic, especially in communities of cover, uh, color. We need to lobby our state and federal governments to commit funds to expand mental health care, improve insurance coverage, increase reimbursement to incentivize clinicians who are providing these services, and we need to grow our mental health workforce through training. Third, we need to address the underlying social and economic roots of addiction. Hunger, poverty, homelessness, and unemployment worsen young people's mental health, placing them at risk for addiction, and yet happen every day in this country. These factors, again, disproportionately affect communities of color and have also worsened under COVID. And yet policies like food stamps, income assistance, child and earned income tax credits, and subsidized housing lift families up and help them thrive. These are the long-term investments that safeguard communities, insulate them against despair, and help people live their greatest potential. We all need to advocate for these policies at every level of government, and when we do, advocate with and for communities that have endured centuries of systemic oppression. Again, stepping aside when needed to ensure that we cede our power and privilege and put at the front of the line the communities that have so often been relegated to the back. Of course, all of these interventions that I've just described right now could be a tough sell to policymakers because today's investments might not show results for decades. But prevention is inexpensive, and every dollar invested leads to many more saved and downstream costs. Some might argue that funding should instead be focused on people who are dying now. I agree, but I also assert that people who might otherwise die in the future also deserve our compassion. We can help people today and also to invest in the people of tomorrow. So as I wrap up today, I want to highlight something. Right about now, the U.S. is quietly surpassing a grim milestone, its million overdose death since the turn of the century. In two decades, a population equivalent to that of Austin, Texas has been lost. Let that sink in. As a pediatrician, I've watched as some of my patients were born during these two decades, lived out their childhoods, and then died suddenly from an overdose. Their entire existence played out against a crisis we have yet to solve. Knowing I would have an opportunity today to share advice with thousands of people from all over the country who care deeply about our cause, I asked Andre's mother if she had anything she wanted me to share with you all. And her answer was simple, don't give up on kids. It's past time we took the long view and doubled down on investing in the health and well-being of young people as our way out of this crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Haben. That was wonderful. We really appreciate your time and your wonderful message today. Um, this does conclude uh, our closing session in all of our summit programming for this year. It has been a pleasure to host all of our speakers and our audience members again, and to continue to bring attention to the stigma of addiction and the ways that it can be dismantled. Uh, we will provide instructions for planning CE at the very end of the session after the final conclusion of the summit and remarks from my co-chair and I. Um, on behalf of Chatterproof, Dell Medical School, and our steering committee, I would like to thank all of our amazing speakers and presenters one more time, and then again, offer our sincere appreciation to our audience members. If you are interested in claiming CE for today's summit, you may do so using the QR code on the slide that will be presented shortly. We will also share a link via email to all of our registered attendees in the coming weeks that includes these instructions as well. We do realize that the issues and concept raised during the summit are inherently nuanced and complex and that there is not sufficient time in the day to address all of the intricacies that we identified today. We do need to continue ongoing and dedicated discourse with a focus on meaningful and tangible impact in our individual spheres of influence. In order to help our audience members apply the lessons learned from the concepts discussed today, we will be sharing a number of resources, including a recording of all of today's sessions, the compendium of all innovation abstract submissions, links to the innovation session finalist videos, 
and the Healthcare Stigma Reduction Best Practice Guide developed earlier this year. Rachel, any final words? Yes, thank you. Um, I echo a lot of sentiments, and we truly are honored at your presence here today, all of you in the audience and all of the speakers. I also want to echo the thanks for the incredible presenters, our planning committee members, our support staff, an amazing team at Shatterproof and at DMS, and to y'all at DMS for your incredible partnership. Unfortunately, while this topic is difficult and it is complex, I do hope that you leave today with room for optimism. The work that all of us are doing represents an incredible opportunity to really rapidly improve our response to this crisis and to reduce substance use disorder stigma and substance use stigma. We have an opportunity to dismantle discrimination, to meet our moment, and to build a more tolerant, more compassionate, and healthier future. We hope you're leaving today with both strategies as well as significant resolve to meet this challenge and to meet it strongly. So we can begin to save lives and improve the well-being of our millions of neighbors, our colleagues and friends and family who face far too many barriers to receiving the care, love and hope they truly deserve. Thank you and have a wonderful night.